What's up everyone, I'm Jake. Uh, I'm here with my mate Hugo in London. We're gonna talk a little bit about a new plugin uh, that is uh, being announced today that I created called the Code Snippet Editor. Um, and Hugo's gonna help me step through it as kind of a designer persona and then I'm gonna kind of come at it from a developer perspective. So, this is the first entry point, right? So this is like where people are yes. going to be able to get access to this in the community? Yes. So in the community, if you search for the code snippet editor, you can learn more about how to use this thing by opening up the docs on GitHub, which we'll show a little bit later. But all the code for this plugin is open source. Um, and I wrote some pretty extensive documentation about how to use it. That's over on GitHub, um, which I'll show in just a second. Um, but from here, you can open this in an existing file you have or use our playground file, which has a bunch of UI kits from the community to try it out on. Let's look at this plugin in action. So we're currently running the code snippet editor right here. Uh, this can be found where it would normally say CSS by default. Um, and so we can just select it from this list and we can see that there's some code here that is uh, thinking about this button as a component, not yeah. as background color, corner radius, like it's not that kind of code, it's the code that describes how to implement a component. So is that something that you would say differentiates from just toggling on CSS? Exactly, right? so if I like go ahead and I, yeah, let's actually just look at this here. Um, for some context. So if I go and select this button down here, we'll see that the CSS for this is describing the color values. In this yep. case, we're actually using some variables in uh, Figma. So it's expressing those as custom properties in CSS, um, which is super handy if we were trying to build the button like as a rounded rectangle with a background color. But the benefit of a component library is that the code that describes all of that is typically already written by the time you go to implement the button in a screen. So the code that you would use in that case uh, is gonna look a lot more um, like this here, which we'll scroll down, um, where these class names in CSS correspond to those colors. They correspond to all of that styling. Or in this case, like a React um, component, these properties map to styles that have already been written. So the secondary variant is already yeah. set to be that purple color. And so when you're implementing this component, you want to know that this is what you need to write. Um, How do you go about doing that then? Yes, let's get <laughs> into it. So one yeah. way to think about this would be like, you know, for this button here, we could write like a code snippet for every variant, yeah. right? And that would still be lacking. Um, and that's what some UI kits actually do. The MUI, yeah. uh, the MUI UI kit actually yeah. has some like good first, you know, draft kind yeah. of code snippets in their component descriptions mm -hmm. to help document each variant. Um, but at the end of the day, that's not going to account for any other component properties. So a boolean, an instance swap, uh, if you have a text property on there, that's not a variant. That's not associated yes. with the variant. So it would be totally missing from that. Yeah. Kind of like and, I mean, I guess this, this is one of the challenges, obviously, with component properties is it hides that visibility at the yes. layer level. But yes. so therefore doesn't unearth the, the, the full capability or all of the possible permutations of that specific component. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So what this plugin allows you to do is write a dynamic snippet at the component level, at the main component yeah. level that can inject dynamically parts of the properties from that component uh, to render conditionally different things in your, in your code here. So let's actually take a peek at that. So when I, I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller. Um, when I open the editor here from the settings, we'll see a bunch of goofy looking code here, but these are the templates. So at the very bottom, we have an example of like a fully static snippet. Like right. there's nothing dynamic about this. We've actually just rendered it down here. Um, and this is just, some kind of like component documentation code to demonstrate like a nuance of the component in code. Yeah. Um, so we've just statically put this here and said, hey, this is JavaScript. So use the coloring for JavaScript uh, in that snippet. Um, so that's the first thing you can do is you can start storing static snippets if you wanted to like, you know, JavaScript comments or something. If you wanted something that was always there for every variant, for every yeah. permutation, you could put that sort of a thing there. The next one up is our React component. And this React component, we'll see that like this template kind of goes line by line from the top down. 
Uh, and the way that the plugin works is it reads this template line by line and determines whether or not to render the line based on a set of conditions. Right. Um, in the case of this first line, there are no conditions, so it's always going to render this beginning of the, the tag of the component. Yeah. The second line, however, has this like double curly bracket thing, and that's indicating we're in template zone now. This is, the yeah. this is something dynamic. And so when it starts with a question mark, that basically means the following statement needs to be true in order to render the rest of the line outside of the curly brackets. So in this case, we have a state variant. So if we look up here, this state variant here can have active, default, disabled, focused. Um, when it is disabled, render this line that's just the word disabled. So for those who don't know, like in a scenario like this, we don't actually treat in the code base, like a React code base specifically, uh, like active, focused, hovered. We don't treat those as props. Those are actually just baked into the style of the component. Right. So in Figma, we express that as a variant. And typically, mm -hmm. that variant also includes disabled because mm -hmm. all of those are mutually exclusive states. Like you can't be focused and disabled at the same time uh, and that sort of a thing. So on this point of like creating all of these different templates out and essentially yeah. like writing rules, are you creating templates for different component sets? So in this instance, obviously, we're rendering we're, 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 we're using this as the logic behind a button specifically. Yes. But if you had uh, a banner, for instance. Or an alert. Or an alert, right. yeah, yeah. Or something along those yes. lines. You can write your own custom template you can and write. bind it specifically. Absolutely. Okay. So like any component, any node actually, like you can, we could write for one frame that we just have floating around a Figma <laughs> or a rectangle. We yeah. could write a template that whenever you select that specific rectangle, it would render code. So yeah, any so component in your library, ID, exactly, okay. it's bound to the node. Um, the benefit of doing it in a component library with components is that anything you write at the main component level will propagate out to all instances of that component. Yeah. Um, so that's really where you get the bang for your buck. Yeah. Um, Speaking of bangs, here's a bang. Uh, so this line here, instead of starting with a question mark, starts with an exclamation mark. And that means the following statement needs to be false in order to render the line. So this is really handy for something like this, where in this case, we're saying if the size variant is not medium, which mm -hmm. is the default size in the code base, yep. then explicitly write size equals, and then here we're injecting whatever the value of size is. So here, the size, we only have medium and small, but we could potentially have a large variant here. Yep. Um, so this is basically only gonna render this line when small or large is the size variant. If medium is the size variant, don't render it. Uh, and we can actually just see that in uh, practice here. If I just nudge this out of the way, I'm gonna select this small one here and we can see size small renders. But then when I select uh, the medium one, it just doesn't render it at all. Uh, this is one like artifact of coding is like, you don't always have to write the defaults uh, and some people prefer not to. I think, um, I think what this is also highlighting, which is kind of interesting from a design standpoint is like, if you even consider yourself mildly code adjacent, it's making you think through when having the conversation with the developers about like the structure for props, mm -hmm. you're getting much, much closer to understanding the implementation because now yes. you can also see this information too. Absolutely. Absolutely. So as you start to add additional props, yeah. you're, there's certain, you're understanding some of the conditions that might need to be yeah. met in order for the template to be updated or whatever Absolutely. it is within the actual snippet editor. Absolutely. Yeah. I think one kind of like artifact of all of this is that like, if you write templates for your component library, yeah. you've kind of put to words how Figma relates to your code base. You've described yeah. it. And that's not something that exists today in a code base. Yeah. Um, there are tools out there that like try to help you like describe how to implement something, but nothing that's explicitly saying this thing in Figma or in our design language corresponds to this thing yeah. uh, in, in the code base. And I think that's really cool that we have just in this little template right here, mm. we've captured that and that that is now authored and written and a part of our documentation. Um, so on this next line, we're only gonna just, we're always just gonna render the variant, whatever the property dot variant is. Um, and then these next two lines are doing the same thing 
for our icon start and icon end. So if we look at the component properties over here, we see we have a Boolean icon start and a Boolean icon end, and those toggle the visibility of an instant swap, which to the coders out there is kind of like a slot property almost. Um, and it allows you to inject a component into a component as a property of that component. Um, Talking of slots, yeah. and there may not be an answer to this yet, as yeah. it is on a, the first version of this. How would this work in the context of nested instances? So where it recognizes and picks up on a button being a subcomponent so within a, you know. The current status of this is that if your instance has properties, yeah you can refer to those properties. So an example would be like, let's say right now we just have an icon being injected into a button as yeah. icon start or icon end or both, um, having both of those true. Um, let's say our icons also had a property called size and it can mm -hmm. be small or medium. Yeah. Um, you can refer to those properties as well. So you could detect, oh, this is the instant swap of icon and it's, currently set to be the small variant. So I'm gonna render the icon and a property within that as small. So you can do that today. Okay. Uh, in terms of children and yeah. nested instances, haven't gotten there yet. It's a question of how we wanna go about thinking about this. But yeah. one thing I could do is say, if there is a template on the child yeah. component, yeah. render that child's thing inside of the parent's yeah. template. And um, that's, I think, I think yeah. long term that might be just an interesting way because definitely on the list. It, yeah. Even if it's somebody creating a local component, yeah. and it's uh, uh, we're working towards a way where design systems are being more composable, as yeah. in like you're giving designers more um, freedom to explore based on just using yeah. things that are an atomic level. Yeah. Then you're going to get a local component where that's yes. going to be helpful for engineers yeah. to be like, I know that that instance yep. and that subcomponent basically mm -hmm. is something that already exists. What we would system, probably want to do, top level. 100%. So like one, what that would look like, this is just fun yeah. conversation. What that would probably look like is allowing you in the templating language to say figma.children. Right. And then that would, because where you want that yeah. It's kind of up to you and kind of depends. So yeah. what we would want is something that says, hey, insert figma.children here. And yeah. that would then go and find every children that has a template yeah. and then put it right there. And yeah. then that would be recursive. So if those yeah. children had children or whatever, yeah. that yeah. would also be extended in that direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think this is interesting because it's almost like yeah. there's a specified format that needs to be there and in an intentional way for something like a button, because we really need to say that it is a button yeah. in code. Yeah. And then it maybe sometimes becomes more abstract when it's these combinations of different things yeah. as to whether there is a semantic yeah. uh, name that's associated or a, like a class name that, that is um, defined, I guess, yeah. within the code base already yeah. for that. So, um, Absolutely. Um, let's finish up these icons. So yes, sorry. No, this is all great. these tangents. That we Hugo and I do this all the time, <laughs> and it just gets worse when we're in person. Um, so we have property dot icon start and property dot icon end. Yep. But as we see here, there's a boolean and an instance swap named the same way. Yeah. So in that scenario, in the templating language, there's another like additional dot and then it's the first letter of which type you're referring to. So that could be a Boolean instance, uh, a string uh, or a variant. So that can either be dot V dot S dot B dot I. Um, so we can say when the icon start Boolean is true, then render the icon start instance, which is just going to be the name of that instance. Mm -hmm. um, and then what we can see here is something new, which is this pipe line. And after that allows us to manipulate that text. So in this case, the icon start is like an icon heart. Yeah. Um, Pascal is saying, turn it into Pascal case, which is a capital camel case. Um, so this is our way of transforming the text to be whatever the language that we're working with. Uh, Desire. So in the case of like, let's actually select something with an icon here. Well, maybe we can even take an instance out and then make a modification. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, we'll switch back. Uh, I just wanted to show really quick. Oh, you've got an example here, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so in this case, in the HTML, we want to refer to the icon in the hyphenated lowercase, which is kebab the, case, the yeah. default value. Yeah, the kebab case. Uh, and then in the 
React, we want it to actually be the Pascal case because that's how that would end up looking. Yeah. Um, and I've actually been speaking with a customer who said, hey, this is really great. We have a lot of components that have extra things in their name. Uh, and so I'm working on a new thing to bring to this templating language that would allow you to remove mm -hmm. like strings from the name. So like, let's say you have like an excess word at the beginning, you yeah. can specify remove the first instance of this word or remove the last instance or remove any instance of this word from the thing and yeah. it would strip that out. Um, so we're working like on like- Like concatenation that you might do in an Excel sheet. Yeah, or exactly. Or so or it allows or... you to kind of, the cool thing about the templating language is you only really need to worry about stripping things out because yeah. you're adding things in yeah. uh, around it. Um, and so, uh, let me go back up to the main component here. I need a better button to do that. Um, perfect. So that's what we're doing right here is where this is an example of us checking. And this is only because the Boolean and the instance swap share a name. Like in some libraries, this would be show icon start and then you wouldn't have to worry about the types at all yeah. uh, because the names wouldn't collide at all. Um, yeah. But this is a common problem. Like I had this problem, I built a component inspector which tried to do this but automatically and you can only go so far. And like this exact scenario is really hard to code for because you have to like recognize, oh, this is a Boolean that's only showing and hiding an instance Therefore, we don't want to show that, but we want that logic to be applied to whether or not we render the yeah. code for the slot and that sort of a thing. So this allows you to just put it in the text. And it's, it's changing, I guess, some of the, the shift in the priority from where in the component inspector level, it was um, requiring a, a specified um, nomenclature that was needed from the designer. Inside exactly. The it, it required that you aligned your language exactly with, yeah. Yeah, in order to be able to make that more readable. Yes. But this is now saying, let's just not worry about that, put a translation layer in between, yes. and then we can get exactly what because we need. Because like we saw earlier, like with disabled, it's like, there are scenarios that literally just are different in Figma than code. Not yeah. because one isn't good enough, but because it's a different environment with yeah. different patterns. Um, so then last but not least, we have like a, a, an on-click property. This is just an example of like a static thing you would add to your template that's mm -hmm. like all buttons have a click event. So I'm just writing that explicitly for our developers to have available to them. Uh, and then we're referring to the label property, which was our text property up here, which allows you to insert any uh, text that you want into mm -hmm. the button. Uh, we saw down here, like that was hello world. Um, but in this case, because uh, the templating language by default converts everything to kebab case, lowercase hyphenated, uh, if you want to refer to the raw value, including any special characters that would be stripped out otherwise, you just add the raw filter. This is like the only scenario where you actually want the raw value most yeah. of the time. It's like as a child like this. This could be quite interesting if you, again, this depends on how people end up using collections for variables, but I'm mm -hmm. wondering whether if you had a mapping that your UX writing team were creating of a variable set of text strings, mm -hmm. that you could render the same variable name or even like ones that are specified mm -hmm. for different platforms yeah. and render that out as well. So it's like, although we have, although we have like some free yeah. text within this, this actually refers to this particular yeah. um, copy uh, key Absolutely. that's utilized within the code base. Yeah, yeah, that'd be really interesting. Um, it's just another because that's that's another yeah that's interesting like would that even be a text property anymore or would that be it wouldn't be a text property no. in a component it would just be kind of like the idea of a variable exactly existing. an idea of a variable that exists within the code base mm. that would Very also would map to a variable that's yeah. within the collection yeah um, that's again, really cool you could, that that could be something that could be tied between the REST API connection as well as in like you could update collections of text strings right through that and then they would also surface inside the game. So we need like a, yeah, I, I need, no, 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 this is, this is great. We, yeah, like I would almost want like nested variables. Yeah. As something that you could bring into the templating language. Yeah. Um, okay. That's really cool. Um, okay. So that covers our React template here, yeah. um, which we've kind of seen in action. Let's talk for a quick minute about the button because this is where things kind of get really interesting. So as we uh, kind of see with like HTML, CSS class names are typically all rendered out on one line. Yeah. Um, and so this line by line pattern doesn't really line up with in a row like that mm. all too well. 
So the way the templating language attempts to handle that is it says, if you want anything to appear on a single line, there's a convention that treats line over line as yeah. a space instead of a new line, if that makes yeah. sense. So that's what this backslash is right here. So mm -hmm. this backslash is basically saying, instead of creating a new line after the word button, we'll create a space. So we can see that like, uh, we have the same disabled logic here. So property.state is disabled, render disabled. Uh, let's actually just select a disabled button here. Um, we can see that disabled is right in line with button. Um, there's gotta be a better way to do this. So this line gets sucked up here, if that's mm -hmm. true. The reason we don't put it on one line is because if we did, if the state was not disabled, it wouldn't render the rest of the line. Right. right okay. um, and so you want the templating language treats every line as a statement of like, right. are we going to render something or are we not? And sometimes yeah. we don't. Um, and so we definitely want to render this. Yeah. <laughs> and then we want to have a space after it. So we put a backslash instead of a new line. Yeah. Um, so we're doing the same thing with a class. Um, I'll get to why there's a double backslash in a second. But then down here, we have the property size medium with the default thing again, where it's like only if it's not medium, yeah. render this button size whatever the size is class. Uh, then we have our variant, just like we did with React. We have a similar kind of icon start and icon end logic here, except instead of rendering the icon, we're actually putting a class on the button that says has icon start, has icon end, because that's just being handled in the CSS somewhere mm -hmm. in that way. Um, now, before we move on, I'm gonna talk about just really quick, uh, and we might even cut this from the video because who even cares? Uh, this is very complex, but it's... It's in the documentation. It's in the documentation. <laughs> but uh, basically, if I don't have an extra slash here, we'll see that we get this extra space because we've, we've said class replaced with the space for whatever comes next. Yeah. So to remove an excess space that's preceding something, yeah. you just add another slash yeah. And then that'll remove that space from what's rendered. Yeah. Similarly, if I don't have this space as a prefix on this line, we're going to get a trailing space at the end yeah. here. And so this is just, you know, developers care about this sort of thing. Like we want really precise exactly what we would implement. Yeah. So there's a way to trim a trailing in a, in a, in a preceding space. Yeah. Um, and so that's all that extra slash is there. And that's all this slash is here. So if we look here, we've actually got... Uh, our icon start hyphenated with span class icon and then you know that sort of stuff is working well and then we have the icon end down here but in between we actually have four lines of code um, yeah. that are all rendering the label in different ways yeah and the reason for that is because when I come down here and I select something with an icon in our HTML this is a common pattern that like we're gonna render the icon has icon end but then we also, for whatever reason, are gonna wrap this in a span too, mm -hmm. but only when there's an icon before or after it, or both. Yeah. Um, and that's because of how we're doing the internal layout maybe. And we wanna like add yeah. margin in a certain way. And so in order to do that, we wanna make sure that that HTML is in there. So yeah. logic like that exists in different languages and frameworks all the time. And so the way that we can handle that is we basically wanna say, if there's an icon start or there's an icon end, or there's both, wrap that 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 label in, in a span. span. Yeah. Um, and so that's what these four lines are doing, is they're basically checking multiple conditions. That's why this demo's in here. Is it saying, if icon start is true, and icon end is false. If icon start is true, and icon end is true. If icon start is false, and icon end is true, then wrap property label in a span. Yeah. Otherwise, if icon start is false, and icon end is false, just inject it in there by itself. Um, so this might seem suboptimal, but in the grand scheme of things, doesn't take any time to write. And we're not rendering pages of this. So it's yeah. not really an inefficient thing at this level of snippet generation yeah. uh, to bring into this templating language. Um, so anyways, you can handle all sorts of if else combinations if you need to, uh, to solve for problems like that. Um, so that's the gist of how this thing works. I think one thing that I want to share before we show it in VS Code, which is something exciting to talk about, um, I'm going to actually shift D into design mode. Uh, shift D toggles into dev mode uh, and then out of dev mode. Um, 
And we're going to run this plugin really quick inside of design mode. So code snippet editor. And when we get, I'll shrink this one. If we hit export here, uh, we get every component key that has or has had data on it for this plugin. And we see JSON output of mm -hmm. their code snippets. We also have the ability to import batch at the file level. So let's say that you have a file that has your entire component library de defined in it. Yeah. You could export all of those templates, save that JSON somewhere, mm -hmm. and then import it and do batch updates, bulk updates to your component library, um, which is kind of critical. Is that reliant on selection? Or no, it's, it's, it's just, just reliant on it. Following. So, but the thing is like... The reason I ask that yeah. is because obviously components are often split across multiple different pages. Yeah. Yes. So, re then reapplying so it what you could do if you wanted yeah. to, this doesn't override anything that's missing. So right. you can export everything, modify the ones you want to modify, then only put those in here and yeah. import and it'll only update Take those. Place. So if you want it to do that sort yeah, of, it won't, it won't like erase everything yeah, else. Yeah. 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 So um, if I want to come in here and just be like Hugo, uh, and I'm just going to bulk import. So now when we close this, we go into dev mode. We should see Hugo is now in that title. So we've we've done a batch process to update that. Yeah. Um, in template, in yeah. Exactly. So you could do that with the, the other benefit of this is like you might actually want to. Um, you might actually want to author these somewhere else, mm. like outside yeah, yeah. of the plugin. Um, and I have something for you there too. Uh, I'm going to quickly update that one, remove your name. Sorry, love that's, your name, but we're going to actually remove it from the code. Um, let's say you're doing this for the first Last time. Last time I checked, I'm not a JavaScript fan. Yes. <laughs> so let's say you're doing for this flavor. for the. <laughs> let's say you're doing. Uh, wouldn't be so sure. Um, so uh, let's say you wanted to do this for the first time. You don't have any templates on any of your things. Yeah. You hit this component data uh, button and it'll show you every single component in your file uh, mm -hmm. with the component key. So in this case, we're actually also seeing all of the icons in the file. So mm -hmm. all of, I have a whole bunch of icons in here. Yeah. Um, and so what this is doing is this is giving us kind of data to start if we yeah. want to go and it shows you the lineage. So if this was in a frame, in a frame, in a frame, you'd see all of that to be able yeah. to figure out which one you're looking at. Yeah. Um, but then you could add a template to this as a starting point yeah. uh, because you don't know what these keys are by heart, you know? Yeah. And so this is this could be a really easy way to get going if you wanted to start in bulk yeah. instead of manually. Uh, and then the only other thing that I want to share here is if you did want to like build these outside, mm -hmm. you're going to want to have stubbed out data. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you select a bunch of things and you hit node params for the selection, this shows all of those params in their kind of like lowercase hyphenated version and their raw version mm. um, with the kind of like button instance and then here's the node ID. So yeah. if you wanted to just like get a whole bunch of data to test with, uh, yeah. you can do that as well uh, over your current selection. So those are kind of like the batch bulk operations that you can do with this plugin. Um, can you return the node IDs from inside of VS Code in that way? Um, yes. Because I'm just thinking of where you might want to author it might be in a, in a yes. file alongside. Uh, so you can actually do that this second, but that would be something that we could add pretty okay. easily. Um, I would basically, yeah. I'm just wondering whether running the plugin, being able to export it in line. That's totally that. something that could be added. Um, and the way that that would work, let's actually look if at- If that would be helpful. I if know. it would be helpful. I think it I depends on what you're trying to do. Um, yeah. It depends I'm, on what you're trying I'm to do. I'm thinking about circling through the canvas and updating the snippets based on each selection that you're mm -hmm. making. Yeah. So kind of returning the ID, but just writing that in, writing the formatting in something that's not actually directly in the plugin yep. itself. Then copying, copying that snippet out, pasting it in, but yep. obviously keeping yep, yep, a yep. full record of the full file. So as a part of, so right now, plugins can run in VS Code today and you can add support for them. Um, and we're, that's very recent that yeah. that got released. 
um, and I've implemented it with this plugin. So if you're a plugin author and you're, you want uh, to run your plugin in VS Code, VS Code is a new capability in your manifest.json that you can add. Uh, and But coming down the road eventually, as people start to adopt this stuff, we're gonna have additional APIs. So like suggest code in VS Code, mm -hmm. like you know at the cursor level, um, or the ability to you know, potentially go the other direction and like maybe communicate with the plugin from VS Code. Yeah. Those sorts of things are like the sorts of things we're exploring and thinking about. So anything you can do to like explore this space and like yeah. give us feedback is crucial. As a developer advocate, please tell me all the things so that I can get the things I want in front of our <laughs> team <laughs> uh, and, and we can hear them for you and have it validated and, and yeah. get that stuff into the product. We have the full exact same functionality inside of here. Uh, that we were just playing with. Um, and so we've selected the code snippet editor right here. We can also open up the, the snippet editor if we want to. Um, I'm also gonna do something that we could do in Figma that we didn't do earlier, which is open the plugin in details mm -hmm. mode. So details mode takes the current selection and it shows you the template, where the template's coming from. So this instance is inheriting from the component set. It shows the value you expect for that template. Um, and so then here's the next template, the next snippet, next template, next snippet. But then it shows you everything that you can refer to in the template. Yeah. So we've been talking about properties. Uh, we can bring in things from the node or the component. I also have put in our CSS output here. So if you want to refer to anything in the CSS, you can. Uh, that that's present on the current file, uh, as well as any bound variables. So in this case, we've bound a bunch of variables to the gap, uh, the item spacing, the padding, the corner radiuses. Um, we also have fills. We're using color BG brand secondary. So we have access to that if we wanted to ever pull that into our template. Uh, and we also have auto layout values. So if you wanted to like detect when it's center aligned vertically or something, you can yeah. theoretically write a conditional statement to detect that. Um, so anyways, as you're building out templates, this is going to be very ha uh, handy. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of that node params export that we were talking about yeah, earlier yeah. in bulk. Yep. We can get that individually inside of the plugin itself by running it in details mode. So that kind of covers the gist of this here. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, looking at something like this while we're over here and we're coding is going to be really handy. So import the button and then we have... Well, let's just say the variant here, uh, and then I'm gonna select primary. Oh, in this case, it was actually secondary. Uh, and then we got icon start, and then let's pull in the icon heart solid. And so that's gonna automatically import up there at the top, and let's just add hello world. Uh, and then I think it's gonna want us to put an empty on click in here as well. So we'll do that to be type safe, boom. So this is kind of how you would go about implementing uh, the code you're seeing here. We could also always copy and paste that in. So if I'm gonna just paste that in and in the, in the scenario in which we don't have this available, we get those errors and we can come in here and just, uh, we can come in here and we can just add all missing imports and that's gonna go ahead and import those values for us. So yeah. pretty handy workflow. Um, the last thing we'll cover here this is up on GitHub, Figma slash Code Snippet Editor plugin. Uh, I've written some pretty extensive documentation on all the little bits and pieces that we've covered here today. Um, all the little things in addition to some examples. Let me find. And you have some switch cases up there as well. I, I do. Know, yeah. I noticed when you're yeah. talking about a lot of the yeah. FL statements that there might be a way to do it with switch. And yeah, so a switch statement would look like... Uh, where did I put that thing? The switch. switch. So in this case, you literally just write if the property is A, B, C. Like yeah. it's these patterns exist. They don't yeah. like require any additional thought. It's just yeah. the way the templating language works kind of allows you to do that. So like if property is A, if property is not A, is an if else can be yeah. a statement. You know. Yeah. Um, we also have uh, those filters that I was talking about earlier. So raw, yeah. Pascal, Camel, Snake, hyphen, constant. That's what would yield these things right down here below. Yeah. Uh, a little bit on details mode, the bulk stuff. I've just got a bunch of documentation here. So feel free to comment on this uh, repository, put out a PR, issues, whatever. Very eager to hear how you're learning it. Um, 
I don't think I stated this earlier, but it saves to shared plugin data. So if you want to build this internally, but aren't sure whether or not you like it, you can use this plugin as is from the community. Mm -hmm. uh, and any templates you write will be in shared plugin data, which means any plugin you write can access those templates without worrying about like not having access. So um, these templates are just going to kind of sit in the, on the node in the kind of like uh, shared space. So if you want to go ahead and privatize a plugin, build some like default templates into it or something like that, don't worry. Go ahead, use this plugin as is. And if you want to cross that bridge later, you can if you really like it. And you don't have to worry about it over investing in something like this. Nice. That's that. Um, the one last thing. The one last thing that's not the one last thing. The one last thing that's not the one last thing. Uh, from here. So one last thing from here, you can open this in a playground file, uh, which I'm just gonna hop on over to. Uh, we won't get into too much detail on it, but I do wanna just show you that it exists. Uh, this playground file, once you go into dev mode, you can run the plugin directly. Um, and what it has is kinda, let's hide this. Um, it has kind of a little intro, uh, but then kind of here's how it works, here's how to use it. It has a link to the code base, a link to the file on the community. Um, it also has button components from the seven, seven like popular UI kits yeah. in the Figma community. Uh, and I've written like a template that begins to kind of like get into, we can see here. So here's the material UI, right? And so if we go and we inspect this button main component, we can actually just look at the template that is rendering this material UI snippet, right? Uh, so we have the same thing for, this one's kind of cool. So the material three, uh, I'm doing like a basic Jetpack Compose. Uh, I Looks like I wrote does this work in the <laughs> template and I, I need to take that out of the community file. But we also have material design components for Android. We also have material design components web. So this is kind of just showing like what this could look like. Like I think it would be so cool if UI kits in the community yeah. like adopted this so that anyone who uses it could also get the code when they use that file. Because it's just bound to the nodes on the yeah, canvas. Yeah, it's just bound to the nodes on the canvas. Yeah. And so uh, it would be published with any component library update. Yeah, super cool. Amazing. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, this was a bit long, but it was fun and worth it. This I is going to be fun in the edit. It'll be fun <laughs> in the edit. See you in eight hours. All right. Bye. Thanks, everyone.